Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. The country today is in some sort of turmoil. Kidnapping is the new booming business. Banditry and terrorism are on the rise. Fuel rises and they falls without the knowledge of those in power. Where do we even start from? Or where do we even go from here? So welcome to The Advocates on Plus TV Africa, where we discuss thought-provoking topics in an atmosphere of seriousness, thoughtfulness, and laughter. Here we call a spade as it is, and as always, there are no holds barred. Today, I'll be speaking about the scam that is in the ease of doing business in Nigeria. My good friend Kinsley Ezene here is advocating for a Nigeria where the young have a voice. We still the way to, and Raymond is elucidating on the difference between positional leadership and a functional leadership. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Nigeria's ease of doing business is just a scam. Now, truth is that Nigeria is perhaps the hardest place in the world to own and run a business. From multiple taxation by FIRS, LIRS, or whatever your state tax agency is called, to even being taxed to get your own tax clearance certificate. To the clear impossibility of getting loan from a bank to scale your business, you literally need friends in high places to help your ministry before you can get loans from the bank of industry. Should we talk about the fact that you can't rely on the powered companies that will be dancing disco with your electricity? And the fact that if PACN, or better still, NEPA brings the light, you have to take a vow of silence or else they will take their light back. That is even sickening. And if that wasn't bad enough, the government arbitrarily raises the price of fuel without notice. And the president, who doubles as the minister of petroleum, says... He is unaware of any price increase. May, well, maybe fuel price just got tired of being at 165 Naira and decided to climb to 212 Naira. Today, Paystack and Flutterwave were recently in the news for multi-million and billion dollar valuations. I am sure that FIRS will soon send them a congratulatory invoice. Maybe Paystack and Flutterwave will someday move to Ghana Canada, or even Mauritius to do this business from there. Our Grammy Award winners, um, Bonaboy and Whiskey. I hope you got a congratulatory message from the president. It is clear that our government only celebrates you when you succeed outside of Nigeria and don't need their help. If you are in the business of importation today, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a container to be cleared at their papa ports. What about the several policy somersaults concerning cryptocurrencies and FF, uh, NFTs? It's almost impossible to transport your goods on, on our roads without police extortions. And don't even ask me how the, 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 the real players in, that, the players in that real economy are surviving with all manners of levies, double charges from both federal, state and local government task force agents coupled with forceful ex uh, collections by touts who work for the same government agencies or politicians as it were. And mind you, these entrepreneurs are the ones driving the economy, the real economy at the bottom of the pyramid. That's, well, that's what happens when you, are, you, you have analog leaders who are out of touch with today's digital economy. The financial institutions, Unko, ah, which one is stamp duty? Did I use the post office to, uh, when, when I was making my transaction? 
why do they charge for account maintenance? Isn't my money being in your account enough to maintain my account? Look at this analogy. You bought shares 15 years ago at 50 kobo per share. Today, it is 83 kobo. After 15 years, the value, in fact, the value of your 50 kobo back then is even worth more than the value of your 83 kobo today. Is Nigeria not useless? Well, maybe it's better to be on the next flight to Canada to start life all over again. So tell those policymakers that their ease of doing business is not by speaking English. Examining the ease, explaining the ease of doing business um, to a businessman is like explaining what GDP is to the common man on the street. It just doesn't make sense. So I maintain that this concept of the ease of doing business in Nigeria is just, is just a scam. That was quite an interesting introduction. And yeah. I agree with you completely that the ease of doing business in Nigeria is just a scam. As, as a matter of fact, at some point, I started wondering if the Nigerian government just calls for an executive council meeting and then they sit and ask themselves, how do we make life difficult for Nigerian youths? Because you check government policies, you discover that almost every government policy is aimed at stifling entrepreneurship and making Nigeria harder for people who are coming up. True. And over the years, I've tried to make sense out of this act. And only one thing came to mind, okay? That the government is trying to weaponize poverty. Hmm. That is what came to mind. Because the only way they will continue to stay in power is if they weaponize poverty and illiteracy. That's where they will have a willing mass of young people who are available to be used as political stooges. Okay, so the government is doing this thing deliberately. The truth is that Nigeria can only be an incubation for greatness, right? Mm. But Nigeria cannot bet greatness. And that is why the dream of the average Nigerian youth now is to get a Canadian <laughs> visa or US visa. And when you look yeah. at it, you discover that if visas could rain yeah. like rain, <laughs> Nigeria would be empty. You know, we were discussing about that when we were coming about, you know, this whole issue about a lot of people trying to leave Nigeria. And I agree with what you are saying because... Um, these guys are exposed, right? So you can't say they don't know what to do. Yeah. Even the uh, average Nigerian who, who have had an opportunity to go to probably Togo or Benin Republic, which is just behind here, used to get back to the country with a completely change of mindset, like challenged to really put into work some of the things that they have seen. And here we see people who constantly have to get into those places. They have allies, they have friends, they, some of them live there, mm. and they can't replicate what the, is happening there. You know, what really, really gets me so sad about the nation called Nigeria is the fact that we are massively blessed with all kinds of things. I mean, look at Bonaboy and, uh, and Whiskey. And I love the line that where, where you talked about, it appears that our government are only interested in celebrating our own from outside. Yeah. You know, just yesterday, nobody was talking about Ngozi Okonjiwala. Today, she's like a god exactly. to everybody. Everybody is talking about her. Mm. Everybody is singing her praise just because she has really stretched herself to succeed outside. We see a lot of Nigerians who have to, you know, uh, even now we're seeing a lot of our medical doctors who can't even do their business here mm. because having passed through the process of, you know, perfecting whatever thing that they are doing here, there is no enabling environment. Some of them are passionate about giving these services. Mm. They don't have tools. They don't have instruments. The facilities are wasted. You go to do some of these hospitals, you are wondering who did we really, really offend that we are here with the kind of money that we have, uh, with the kind of resources we have, intellectual resources we have. We do not have any uh, disaster, no hurricane. Not any of these things happen in this country. You now begin to really wonder what is our problem. And when you talk about ease of doing business, I can tell you that these guys are doing this thing deliberately. And like Kinsley pointed out, weaponizing poverty, making sure that people are illiterate because you can't really you know, question what you don't know about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who come out to question some actions are people who, who can compare. You can't compare yeah, one thing. You can only compare two mm. things. So yeah. you look at what A is, you know what B is, you mm. can now compare which one is better. So, so the only people who can compare 
are people that are exposed. And these men know that provided people continue to evolve, to know what is obtainable, they just want to keep them down. Cryptocurrencies show that. Yeah. Because now, there are a lot of young people who can no longer rush to politicians to wash their car, mm. to collect money to buy a bottle of beer. Yeah. So you can see how cryptocurrency is actually empowering a lot of young people. They are helping their families. Mm. They can pay their school fees. They can start up their businesses. And they no longer care about the kind of car a politician drives into yeah. their community with. Mm. So as a politician, immediately you are entering into the community, the young men are comfortable. They are going to school if they want to go to school. They are traveling abroad if they want to travel abroad. They are helping their families to take care of the uh, onions, bags mm. of onions, the yeah. maggi, the, the paper that you use to impoverish people. Their children are beginning to provide those things. So they are asking themselves, why is it that when we get back to our communities, mm. these young people are no longer rushing to us to buy them drinks just like they used to do. And they discover that wow, they are beginning to find alternatives. Yeah. And that's what cryptocurrency is bringing. And the next thing is that they now want to say, we need to mm -hmm. go and find out how what? do we take hold of this? How do we regulate it? You know, when you hear these people talk, you begin to really wonder, is it like they don't treat about global trends? This yeah. is where the entire world is going. And how is it that it's just a group of people in, in Nigeria that are suddenly saying that uh, Bitcoin came from the tin air? When this is something that is making people billionaires, when the richest man in the world at some point invested 1.5 billion yeah. in something that somebody in, most, in one chamber yeah. in Nigeria is saying it came from tin air, it's really, really very sad. You know, I I find <laughs> I find it interesting sometimes um, thinking about Nigeria. It's it's um, it's 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 a world right um sometimes i ask myself where like you rightly said mm. who did we offend the you know sometimes i date back to our independence no 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 to the slavery you know people argue that oh it's not um many nations people everybody they are, nigeria is not the only nation that was enslaved uh, but i don't know you know maybe we have not taken our time to to deal with the psychological, the transference of the psychological um, decadence or psychological negative impact of that thing on us. Because a slave does not own anything. And if you look at it, really, we still behave like, like that. A slave believes that the master has to give him everything. And mm. look at it. Um, our government, from the federal, state, and local government, is running on rent, rent collection uh, 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 model. So we wait for federal allocation and we ignore all the resources within us. So you see the Nigerian government, they are with the, how we embrace what, what is coming out, but we don't mind what is within. You said Bonner boy. I mean, but if you know the price that guy paid to get there, the question is how many people can be as lucky as Lubona boy. There's the hard work. There's the hard work he put in there. So I'm not I'm yeah. not um, talking yeah. down on that. There's the hard work he yeah. put in there. But imagine that you made it easy for every other young person. I mean, you, you know, know when you talk about ease of doing business, uh, and that reminds me of uh, Dubai, the nation mm. of the UAE. One of the things they are doing right now, and, and that's why you can find a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners are beginning to, like they're beginning to, I would say they, have, they are now pouring into that nation. You know what they are doing right now? They First of all, they've opened up their borders. They've opened up their borders. They say, we really want you to get into mm -hmm. our space. Nigerian system is such that nobody wants to get into this space. Because you get into this space, you get swallowed up. You get into this space. Now, one of the things that business owners in Nigeria do, nobody wants to put out their... Nobody wants to put out their, 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 their billboard and all those stuff because mm. immediately you put out your billboard, you have that same day you have 20 agencies Coming that are to... going to bombard you and give you list of taxes, list of all kinds of things yeah. that you have to pay. But you get to these nations, they open it up, they just tell you this is what it requires. Yeah. And once you pay it, they provide you with everything. In Dubai, with as little as I think $6,000, $5,000, $6,000, they you just register a business with them. They give you an office. They give you everything. They give you internet. They say, come and live with us. Now, they are now from, from what they call residency program. Mm. So they don't even want you to be in your country again. Come yeah. and live here. In fact, beyond residency, they also have the one they, the one they, 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 they're planning to now get people to nationalize mm. you know, in the place. So mm. I really think that 
it's a, it's a scam, really. Yeah, if they say okay. ease of doing business. I, I, agree, I agree with you. Okay, I agree with you. I think the problem in Nigeria is that our leaders fetishize foreign validation, right? Mm. When you're coming from outside Nigeria or you're a foreigner, they give you every attention and give you every necessary thing. And it boils down to what Peter said earlier, it's slavery mentality. We don't appreciate our own, but we celebrate foreign people and foreign investments. All right, we are, we, are, we are going on a break now. After this break, Kingsley is next as he, he dreams of a Nigeria where the youth can have a voice of their own. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I grew up with great optimism in Nigeria as my country. From kindergarten through junior secondary school, we were regularly made to recite a song, Children are the Leaders of Tomorrow. It wasn't just a song, it was a legendary battle cry that psychologically prepared us for the daunting task of leading Nigeria and serving as safe agents. We eagerly anticipated that future, full of morale and hope. The future where we would lead our country. The future where our voices mattered, where our dreams were valid, where we could dare to change our country, where the voice of the common Nigerian mattered, and where our fathers will hand us power and not banish us from its corridors. I was proudly Nigerian. I wanted to be president. I believe the government had a plan for youth and that there were systems in place to help us emerge and compete favorably with our mates all over the world. But then, adulthood woke, woke me up to the reality of being a Nigerian in Nigeria. Like most Nigerian youths, I am anything but proud to be Nigerian. I am too scared for my life to speak and demand justice, and I have watched the leaders I elected become my own colonial masters. October 20th, 2020 broke my heart. I am today, like every ordinary Nigerian, faced with the choice of either getting violence as a response for demanding peace or embracing violence in exchange for a peaceful response from government. And I keep wondering, will the youth's voice ever matter in Nigeria? Wow. <laughs> you know, first thing that caught my attention was when you talked about um, uh, the youths are the leaders of tomorrow. Mm. You know, I, I think we also need to get back to that era where we start um, reciting that, uh, that theme where we beginning, begin to start shouting that youths are actually the leaders of today. But again, even if you say, come out and say youths are the leaders of today, I think the only thing it to do, the major thing it to do is to start enforcing this sense of responsibility, not shifting responsibility to tomorrow, waiting for a particular time when you will become a leader before you start taking action. Because really, it doesn't stand for you to say youths are the leaders of tomorrow in today's Nigeria. We are still waiting for our tomorrow to come. Mm. I agree. Um, I, I think it's, it's a big lie. The people that designed that song, either they did it out of ignorance or they intentionally did it just to keep us down. There is nothing like tomorrow. Tomorrow will never come. I think youth are the leaders. That's just what it is. They are the leaders of the moment. Not even the leaders of... They, they are the leaders of the moment, right? Um, Kinsley says something very instructive of, of how um, the people who were supposed to... who were entrusted with the power have held on to it. I think... We are our leaders, not, I don't want to say our leaders, we find it difficult letting go of power. We want to be in charge, we want to control things and stay on it. There's nothing wrong with putting controls in place, but to the degree that we are not able to pass on that baton to someone else, um, it becomes a problem. He talked about in the October 20, um, 2020, um, heartbreaking experience. One, it was like the, con the whole country slapped young people to the face and they said, we don't want you to talk again. That October 2020 is, is significant and it's not just, it's going to stay in the history of Nigeria. Young people were told to shut up and never to talk again. You and know, I see a lot of emotions in what Kingsley wrote in that. Kingsley, can you talk a little bit about, because while you were just, um, you know, uh, citing uh, that, um, I could see emotion, you know, yeah. because I know for someone like you who really wanted to be, or rather, who really wanted now, because I, I'm not sure you still want to be a president, but then, I mean, coming to a place where the people who are supposed to, you know, nurture you to achieve that dream yeah. now seem to be the people that are now, like, uh, trying uh, to stop the dream, exactly. 
you know it's it's growing up in nigeria has been a very painful experience okay. especially psychologically you know i was very patriotic if you knew me earlier than now i was pro nigeria i never had the intention of leaving the shores of nigeria and i had an experience in 2013 that solidified that conviction right mm. i was a captain of the national team president's debate team and we were going to represent nigeria at a world tournament in turkey we just landed in istanbul international airport and on our way to the arrival segment they demarcated everybody that came out from our flight into three they said americans and europeans this side others this side others including africans Ghanaians, and then they said nigerians oh this side <laughs> oh they my. separated nigerians <laughs> as if that was not enough others were allowed smooth passage into turkey nigerians were taken to a separate room where they had i don't know what it is but it was a robot scanners including our eyes and all that i felt so stigmatized the stereotype was too much and I didn't understand why the average Nigerian would be sing singled out for such stereotype, right? So it gave me that impression that the Nigerian life doesn't matter, mm. even outside Nigeria. Because one thing is to leave Nigeria, but when you leave Nigeria, Nigeria follows you. Exactly. Mm. Because the moment you say, I'm from Nigeria, yeah. everybody automatically becomes skeptical. So I was passionate about Nigeria because I felt I could change things. I was going to change something. But the truth is that I'm no longer as patriotic, you know? Why that October 20th event touched me so much is that I could have been there that day. So there is a possibility that I would have been dead by now. I, w I was there on that day. Okay, you I, were I there. Left, I left in the evening um, just because I needed to go and, uh, you know, do some school runs. I was there up until the evening. I just went to do some school runs. It, exactly the same. In fact, my neighbor was there while the shooting was going on. Okay. He left, he ran away and, you know, well, his sister forgot her slippers, one, of, one leg of her slippers. So I know, I felt that October 20 is as real because mm -hmm. I, could, I could see some people that were, you know, pictured dead and I can remember seeing them on seeing the Seeing them on you know, the point. You will never really, really forget uh, what happened on October 2020. And I'm saying this because uh, it's really, really sure that the voice of over 60% of our population do not really count, yeah. right? Young people here will like make up 60% of our population of over 200 million people, and we can't really put our voice together and it matters. It's really something to really worry about. This thing you said reminded me of something. Raymond mentioned 60%. I think a big problem in Nigeria is that young people don't know how powerful they are because the power of the oppressor is derived from the oppressed. I will use the election scenario as a case study. Young people aged 18 to 30 make up at least 65% of the voting population, right? So during elections every year, during general elections, we complain of looting, we complain of rigging of election and all that. But look at the real picture and you understand that the young people are the problem. Who are the vast majority of people who refuse to come out to vote? Young people. Who are the vast majority of people who sell their votes for stipend? Young people. The talks they bring up to maybe hijack and stuff ballot buses and unleash mayhem on INEC officials yeah, yeah. are young people. The security agencies they used to who doing party agents to endorse fictitious election results are young people. The election officials that collect bribe to rig the election and falsify election results are young people, mostly core members. So you understand that the problem is not the old man sitting in Abuja. The problem is the young person who doesn't know how powerful he is and who has allowed himself to be used as a weapon to terrorize him. So what I think is that young people in Nigeria are not educated enough. You know, there's a difference between being schooled and educated, right? The vast majority of young Nigerians are schooled. Only few are educated because education is about empowerment. It empowers you and shows you this is what I have a right to do and this is what I can achieve, which is why I think the government does not have a robust plan for education. I keep saying it. This government keeps weaponizing illiteracy and poverty because as long as those things are in place, they will continue to get away with almost anything they want to do. See, see Kinsley, I, I, I think um, I agree with you, 
but, but I think, we, let's not see, everything is systemic. I, I was watching the screen, there was, um, the last show that held, I was sitting down there and watching it and they talked about this, this um, um, picture they dug out from the internet about how um, someone said you don't need um, the missiles and all of that to destroy a nation, all you need to do is yeah, to, post, to, to post the education. What they did, they took history out of schools. We don't even know, we never even knew that some people fought for certain freedom until answers. I, I think it's, it's very, very important that people know where they're coming from and it's from what, uh, um, starting from what Kingsley said, uh, when we don't really have an understanding of where we are coming from, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't know our history and so we can't also make informed decisions about where we, you know, are going to and it's a, one of a very, very big problem because we don't know where we're coming from, we don't even know what to say to where we're going. Absolutely. The advocate is better with your participation. It's now time to share some of your viewpoints on issues discussed here. On last week's advocacy, CEO OK says, it seems easy to say, why can't we vote good people into leadership positions? The truth is, power is still in the hands of the same club members, and the platform to represent will never be extended to any outsiders. So Nigerians should rise up to what? Please. Election is not and was never free and fair in Nigeria, but is still massively rigged. Perhaps it's better to understand that Nigerians have long lost hope and are resigned to wait for when the end will come. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, The Advocate Nigeria, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, The Advocate, which hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to pluscvafrica.com slash the advocate ng. After the break, Raymond is differentiating between positional leadership and functional leadership. See you. One of the greatest quotes of all time is that which was made by John C. Maxwell when he opined, everything rises and falls on leadership. How true could this be? Or rather, what could be more true? I am very fascinated by leadership because it enables an individual to see ahead of what others are not seeing. Leadership provides us an opportunity to look forward and further away from others around in order to anticipate the future, predict potential challenges, and keep helping others to prepare and solve emerging problems. Long before I was born, and as I have read and heard, there lived a generation of leaders who were most obsessed about functionality of leadership and the role they played for the people more than the position they occupied. For them, it was never about the position, benefits, or entitlements, but about filling the gaps and supporting the people to heal from their pains through quality and effective service delivery. They lived among the people and felt the pains and joy of the people. They grew among the people, knew what it meant and felt like to suffer all around the sun just to put food on the table. And this inspired most of them to graduate into voices that made sure that the needs of the people were met irrespective of their gender, their religion, and their ethnic status. The reverse is the case today because we seem to have a generation of people who want to occupy positions without a clear vision or well-stated description of duties, I have over time realized that the biggest disease of, to our collective success as a nation is our lack of vision. I discovered that among the different types of leaders, most of them were propelled to notoriety through circumstances and events, which somehow made history to classify them as leaders. And for this reason, the function of leadership has been greatly abused and will keep getting abused because positional leaderships are more than functional leaders. One of the high points of leadership development of any nation is dependent on how credible the leaders are, and this can only be established through action and not words. And I strongly believe that when the security, security and welfare of the people are top priority, the leadership will be demonstrated by what they are doing and not what they are going to do. But the case is different today because we have a generation of people 
who are more soaked up in, in casting vague and immeasurable visions, which further deepens the problem, eating up our nation. Leadership is basically about taking daily actions and not mere words. It has so much to do with leaders' far-sightedness, determination, self-confidence, and sense of good judgment. Today, it is no-brainer that the relationship between leaders and followers is constantly driven by fear instead of love and respect for the people. How true is it that the nation can only be successful as their younger generation? In conclusion, we have enormously huge resources, but what is the usefulness of accelerating so fast in the wrong direction? Hence, we need to get our visions to be sharp while our goals must be clear. But above all, we must be able to develop very strong will with a commitment to face our challenges, question the status quo, and solve our problems by ourselves. Position without function will produce a disastrous leadership. Function, even without position, will always produce a transformational leader. Wow. <laughs> Raymond, I, I think you, 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 really, you really nailed it. Um, I think the way we structure leadership or leading is also um, fueling this whole idea of focusing so much on positional leadership. Um, sometimes I ask people, when you call someone a manager, what does it mean? Mm. Right? I, I, I struggle a lot with titles. I struggle with titles because, um, don't forget, we came from a very uh, suppressed foundation. A slave is suppressed. Now, the, the, the people who were freed are now re-enslaving themselves. So, when you call someone a manager, you put in his head or mind, you are, you are controlling people. But it's about responsibility. It's about yes. daily mm -hmm. actions. I would rather that they, we, we, sometimes we might start from the nomenclature. Yeah. Change the nomenclature. Yeah. When you enter an aircraft, they say someone is a pilot. We know what a pilot does. Yeah. A pilot is the person who, who is charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the cockpit is functioning, the aircraft is flying. But they call someone a manager and he's just busy bossing around people. So maybe we need to start from changing the nomenclature and the defining uh, leadership from the place of responsibility and mm. not... Uh, well, uh, rights because position just confers your, yeah. your rights so let's go from the place of your responsibility your obligation beyond just your rights there is something Raymond said that got my attention where you mentioned the idea of lack of vision the fact that Nigeria and even Africa in general is plagued with leaders who don't have vision you know when you hear most persons talk they say the problem of Nigeria is corruption no I don't agree. I think corruption is just one of the problems, but that is not the major problem. Because as long as I'm concerned, incompetence is worse than corruption. Mm -hmm. You look at the world, you discover that there is no system you will look at, and you will discover that the system is completely devoid of corruption. Mm -hmm. But why are they progressing maybe in Europe? For instance, the recent American election revealed that the concept of in an infallible American democracy is simply a myth, right? Mm. So, but why are other countries or why are other continents progressing? It's simple. They have leaders who are very visionary, okay? And they are backing up this vision with great competence. So because they have a great vision backed up with great competence, you discover that a combination of vision and um, competence obscures the impact of corruption. Mm. So even though they may be corrupt in little ways, they are still doing a lot of things to develop their nations. Mm. So because I think functionality starts with a vision. For you to be a functional leader, you must have a vision. You discover from the presidency that the vast majority of Nigerian politicians get to power without a plan. Mm. The president had been trying for years. He tried four times, eventually became president, and this is where Nigeria is. That is proof that his ambition to become president is purposeless determinism. He didn't have an agenda. He didn't have a vision. He didn't have a plan. He just wanted the position. The agenda is, let me get to that position and be called president. And, and, and I think, you know, we have it today, even as... You know, in the lead of to, I'm very, very passionate about this issue about, you know, positional and functional leadership because I think that is really where the problem is. When I hear people talk about uh, corruption, I don't really give, you know, attention to it because corruption is not about people that are in power. It's not about uh, the presidency. It's, it's, it goes down to even the universities. It goes down to the schools. It goes down to the homes and all those stuff. 
I, I, I try to focus on the fact that what is the connecting point where, from where you are, where are you going, and what are you willing to put in to get to the to get that result that you want. So we have a lot of people. I was privileged to be a you know a political office holder at some point during when I was still growing up, and I left that space because I saw a lot of positionality more than functionality. So we see a lot of people who, like, like when we started, I was telling us that, I, I, I told you guys earlier that there are a lot of people who circumstances or events made history to classify them as leaders. So you see someone who is a cultist, who they know that he fights very well. Mm. He knows how to destroy people's homes. Mm. As a result, that circumstance confers on him because yeah, each time he yeah. comes to shout, every other person keeps quiet. Automatically, yeah. he's seen as a leader. Mm. Why? Because circumstance conferred him and not the function, not the result he produced. And the child, the, what you will always find out is that this person gets into the space without plan. And that's why you see some of these people, they don't want to come out because they don't have the functional attributes. Yeah. There is nothing that can sustain them. It is Functional leadership is sustainable. Mm. Positional leadership, you get frustrated immediately you are out. Yeah. So they know that immediately they go out from that place, they forfeit the right that you mentioned. Yeah. They forfeit the right. Mm. There is no sense of responsibility. People will no longer see them. People will continue to respect them, provided they are in that space yeah. where they are called all kinds of big, big names. And I don't like that. I'm not a person of title, just like you. I, I, I think one of the major problems, or one of the major reasons why Nigerian political space is mostly full of positional leaders mm. is tied to remuneration that is attached to those political offices, right? Mm. So you discover, let's say for instance, every governor in Nigeria, the least governor receives the at least security vote of 400 million naira monthly. That is not allocation, that is not his salary. Security votes are largely unaccounted for. So you discover that because of the huge financial incentives there, the vast majority of people going for those political offices are not going there because they want to serve or change a generation. They are going there because they want to amass wealth, amass wealth right? For them, it is an opportunity to take leverage of the lagis in Nigeria. So as long as, when you look at Nigeria, you discover, for instance, that Nigerian lawmakers are the highest paid in the whole world. The world. And Nigeria is not top 10 richest countries in the world. So when you discover that the position of leadership is one that gives you an empire for generations to come, you discover that only few persons have the incentive to go there to serve. But secondly, because of something Raymond mentioned, the rule of law, the fact that once you find yourself in a particular space, you're already above the law. In fact, justice and law does not concern you as long as you're in that space. You discover that people have other meager incentives beyond service to go for that position. What also happens is that because they always or almost always have a kaba or kakus, you discover that they continue to rotate power amongst oh, themselves. Yourself. So the people who actually have vision, who are able to function, who are intellectual and sound enough to do this, don't get to the corridors of power because the people on top only circulate or allow people in their circle. And I always say it, Nigeria is a kakistocracy. The smartest black people in the world are led by the dumbest of their kind, right? And it is a big problem. As long as these things continue, I don't think we're getting anywhere. You know, the thing is, so, so, so question now is, so how do we, how do we, where do we go from here? Um, I think it was um, Erufai, there was, there was a particular show he was on. And he was talking about how he was, he was challenging young people to, you know, he said, go and take the power right nobody's going to give it to you take the power as as raw and um unfair it may, it may, as it, it may sound i think it's it's looking more like it the guys who have this reins of power because of the privileges the perks and the, the sense of you know high superpower that is conferring on them they don't want to let go of it you know, being in political office is like being a, a, a movie star or a musical star. Most of them fall into depression once they are no longer on the stage because that's where they derive their essence from. Well, maybe we need to start from um, the homes, right? Let, let's begin to put a lot of focus on functionality. Mm. 
it's not you are what function are you playing mm. let's start from our little mm. circles what function let's place a lot of emphasis on functional mm. you know let's reward people based on functions they play not based on titles you know you see a bsc holder who can do the job and there's an hnd holder or even someone yeah. who has college of education um, certificate mm. who is getting the job mm. done but you're paying the guy who has bsc or who has masters or who came back from abroad who just has the paper but can't get the job done can we pay for functionality even in the corporate, I challenge corporate Nigerians, pay for co functionality, not for, you know, the title or positions people... And I think that's one have. thing that has really helped a lot of... If, if you look at the statistics of some developed nations, you find out that they are focusing mostly on functionality mm. more than they focus on whatever position that you are mm. and all those stuff. All right. We have now come to the end of this week's episode of The Advocates. However... The advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook at Plus TV Africa using the hashtag the Advocate NG or on Twitter and Instagram using at Plus TV Africa. Don't forget to use the hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. See you. All right. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.